The City of Auburn's Downtown Sculpture Gallery showcases outdoor sculptures in various sizes, types, and mediums. Primarily located along Main Street, the Sculpture Gallery changes annually, providing different artwork for Auburn residents to experience and enjoy. It's really great to work really hard and you're, you're pushing, you're pushing, and then you take it to the powder coat and you get it back and you're like, oh, oh. And then you go install it somewhere and you get to see other people's eyes light up and that, you know, that really sort of completes it for me. It's always really cool, very exciting. Even as we were putting it up, a couple of people drove by and were very excited and complimented us out their window. You know, seeing the piece completed out in public is uh, it's kind of a reward. You know, you work hard and you move them around and you transport them around and it's pretty cool. It's educational for people that don't see it that often. So exciting. I'm so excited that other people are going to be able to smile at it. Putting the piece out in public is great for the artists to, uh, for exposure and to get better ideas about what they want out of their work. Well, I love having it out. There's no point just having it in my yard at home, although I like this piece quite a bit. And it's exciting to have venues where um, my work is accepted and it's out there for the public to see. So thank you, Auburn. Um, today there's Anita Schuler, Debbie Drillvich, and Greg Bartle here, and who's not here is Carol Orr, she's in Hawaii, but the three of us did the installation. Well, we're welders, but we're starting to branch out and use other materials. Um, and what's fun about welding, of course, is that you're focused on that tiny little weld spot and the rest of the world goes away, so we try to do it every day. The frame is welded still, and then we used um, bits and pieces of stuff we could find um, to create the, the center of the, um, I call it kind of a harlequin center. Uh, the leaves are out of welded steel, cut, and then tinted with um, automotive clear coat. And the skirt is made out of aluminum screening. We, we tried to use a lot of recycled. We had done a dress before together and we wanted to do something larger. Um, so the scale, of course, which is, so cool and um, different materials a little kind of steampunk not quite but close and um, the aluminum skirting it's you know just bringing more materials in and seeing what we could do with the larger scale a lot of times we'll start with an idea and really not know where it's going and that's kind of the fun part in this case for this piece it, it's an intermediate piece for us the dress that's on the dancers at Avka Gallery down the street, um, that's a small sort of normal size. This one's a little bit oversized. And our plan is really to do a large piece, a large dress next time and maybe get Tara Holcomb, a nature artist from Seattle, to participate with us somewhere in Auburn. That'd be great. I always worked on my own. I had no idea how much collaboration gave you. It just it completes you as an artist and it pushes you beyond those boundaries that you set on yourself and, and it's just a blast. When an artist works alone, and that's kind of the image everybody has about artists, is they're in their studio working alone, and really what happens then is um, things happen that are a surprise to everybody and you get a way better product by working collaborative. We really, we're hooked now. And it's so fun getting different ideas and um, critiques from your partners and it's like <laughs> yeah. no that really does not work or yeah great idea you Let's know it's, it's, it's really pretty fun my name is Sharon Agnor and I work with steel and glass and it's all kiln fired glass my piece is named living water and it's made from kiln cast glass and welded stainless steel the thing I like about working with steel and glass is that uh, they go through changes when they're subjected to extreme heat um, and what they come out with on the other end of the process is, is something that's more beautiful than you start with and the, uh, the, the idea of subjecting them to heat is just has so many parallels with uh, real life so in these materials they're really stressed 
and then they become something beautiful and I feel like that that's a parallel to the things that we that happen to us as life goes on um, difficult circumstances happen hardships and hopefully we come out on the other end um, a more beautiful person so that's what I like I like that parallel it's very exciting because it's a long process um, and during the process, I overcome a lot of challenges. Usually things don't work in a large scale the way they are when I'm working with a small model or a drawing. I, there's always surprises and there's problem solving and it's challenging. Um, but the first time I see it upright or starting to be put together, it gives me new hope. <laughs> that yeah, this is gonna work and this is gonna be something that's thoughtful and the whole idea is that I wanna make work that is not just beautiful but it has a message and that it causes people to stop and think and maybe starts a dialogue. I mean, that's the whole idea. So it's exciting. Water's an interesting substance um, and I've been thinking about water and doing works about water for the past probably two years. And water is so necessary for life. It gives, um, it, it allows us to live and it allows us to have a beautiful environment, especially here in the Pacific Northwest. And we have an abundance of water. But there's another kind of water and that's a spiritual um, water. And when our physical needs are met by the water in our environment, then we can pay attention to how uh, how our spirits are doing and so um, this life-giving water can bring out qualities of like uh, great character qualities like grace and peace and forgiveness and so there's there's just two waters there's a spiritual water and then there's a physical water and they just go hand in hand and one um, one exemplifies the other it's just Pretty cool, and that's why I like thinking about water right now. <laughs> I'm Pat McVeigh, and I work generally in large wood sculpture. I've worked in a number of other mediums, but I really like wood. I've carved stone, done bronze, clay, uh, I carved snow, ice, but I like wood the best, and especially larger pieces. Uh, I really enjoy wood, it's a uh, medium where y it keeps you uh, in good shape and it's not as um, uh, bad on your health as other forms like uh, bronze and uh, some clay and uh, stonework, which I've tried all those. Uh, the wood, I'm able to uh, get salvage wood from various uh, neighbors on Whidbey Island that uh, where the uh, wood is not gonna be used for anything but uh, burned in a pile or used for fence posts and that kind of thing. So I'm able to uh, give it some new life. This is part of a series of sculptures that I've been doing and it's called Otter Moon. And as you can see, there's an otter. Oh wait, there's an otter hiding on the back of the moon. So uh, this is a series I've done where there's various things uh, uh, that surprise you on the other side. And they're especially good for places like this where people walk by and they see one thing when they go by one direction and then it surprises them when they come back the other way and they something completely different. Well I love uh, nature and I like to challenge myself with difficult projects and that, those are uh, two inspiring things for this piece. Uh, the transition between the moon and the otter on the backside was difficult because I had to match up different features on the faces of both and make it work for both sides. It's a reductive sculpture technique where you take um, one solid mass and, and you reduce it down to the idea that you want. So you, unlike clay where you can build it up and add pieces, uh, when you take away something you can't really add it back on. Uh, and I tend to uh, challenge myself by trying to make it all out of one piece of, of wood. Uh, and uh, it's, it's not always easy to visualize that project, so I'll take whatever I can that's, uh, that I can understand or, or see in my mind, and I'll do that part, and then once I do that part, then the, the rest of it starts to become more clear, and, and then I work my way through the project that way until I get to a, a final, uh, uh, final area where I want to just start finishing it and sanding it and, 
uh, making it, bringing it into focus. Well, my name is Jacob Nobinger. I'm a direct metal sculptor, meaning I work directly with the material, uh, building from a frame and adding the material on. I like that it stays where I put it, and I, I would say the challenge is uh, making something I enjoy and something that will be purchased by other people is a big challenge, yes. Uh, this is the first of uh, Head Above Water series. Uh, this piece was inspired by the subconscious mind. Um, I believe that we are more uh, spirit than body. So we are like uh, a floating ghost. So the, the idea came to me very simply to put a uh, fin on it and uh, a ghost-like face to it and some color to bring some light to it, life to it. So. <laughs> uh, the process in this medium is very extreme, but then uh, this particular piece being painted uh, at the end is really calming and, um, and quiet. Uh, and it ends very peacefully with uh, colors and paint. Um, so I, I'm, I'm leaning more towards painted still because I think sculpture is a frame or a canvas for art. So might as well paint it. <laughs> so my name is Jesse Swickard. I'm a sculptor in Sherwood, Oregon. Work primarily in fabrication. Um, anything from steel to aluminum to glass, a little bit of wood. Um, this piece is welded steel that has been painted. It's called Linked. You know, I like steel medium. Um, you know, it's a challenge that uh, to manipulate steel to make it look like something organic. I think that's my biggest challenge, and I like that part. You know, trying to um, make it so you can't recognize that it's steel. I think that's kind of a fun, a fun medium to use. You know, because it's steel, so tough to move and change. You know, my inspiration for my work is from mostly nature. Um, whether it's water or waves or hiking or snowboarding or mountain biking or climbing. I just see like forms in most things in nature and, and I just sort of just copy that organic form. And you know the process of creating this piece here is uh, sometimes I'll fabricate a model that will help create the bigger one. This piece is more free-flowing where I could kind of match the drawing just from some free-flowing material that I had. And so then you just kind of weld it up and then you try to choose the color that fits, you know, and I thought blue on this one would be a good fit. My name is Miguel Edwards and I'm a sculptor. I work largely in steel, but uh, lately it's been encompassing glass, LEDs, augmented reality, video mapping and stuff like that, but mostly steel. So this piece is called Red Emperor and it is uh, a derivative piece of a piece called Orange Emperor, which I made for the Flower and Garden Show, uh, Northwest Flower and Garden Show at the Convention Center. So yeah, this is, this is the Red Emperor. So this, this is a plant-inspired piece. My inspirations come from all over the place, but really, back to the steel, I'm pretty inspired by just, I mean, the, the process and the materials. There's things that you can do with steel. One of my favorites is you can sort of defy gravity. It just like, you can make things appear in space that don't seem like they are, should be able to. That's one of the things I, I love about it. Um, it's heavy, it's loud, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot of work, it's, it's a lot of physical labor, but I, I love it. I love it the way it smells. I, I mean, just, it's my thing for sure. You know, t <clears throat> titling is a, is a tricky thing for many artists. <laughs> I, my mom often helps, helps me with, with titles, uh, but this one, I, it was just a homage to the, to the previous one, which was Orange Emperor. So I guess that's a series now. Does two make a series? Yeah. We'll call it a series. <laughs> I am Jennifer Ellsworth and I work in recycled metal. I love working with recycled material because it has a first life and before it gets thrown away I want to give it a second life. It has its form and then I can see that form turned into something new. The process I work with, I want to mimic nature and form organic pieces so people can relate to it. My inspiration comes from the parts that I find. Um, I started off 
wanting to make a, a big pine cone. And after I did that, I realized that it could also be a hop. And I wanted to make a hanging fire pit. So I made a hanging fire pit hop, and that's how I displayed it to them. Also, there's a, um, a solar panel in here, and it will light up at night. So it kind of gives it the fire effect. My name is uh, Ben Dye, and I work in steel and stainless steel, mostly. Well, stainless steel is the best thing ever. It, it's, the maintenance is zero, it lasts forever. And uh, when I produce a public sculpture, you know, the long-term goal is like the pyramids. You know, you would love your stuff to last forever. And stainless is probably one of those metals that'll be here forever, so. It's a little difficult to weld, and sometimes it's a little difficult to cut, but other than that, it's, it's very friendly. Yeah, so the, the plating style is really versatile. It, uh, it, it, it lead, lends itself to different forms and shapes and stuff, and, and there's a lot of guys doing boxed stainless, and I'm trying to lean towards that. You know, there's a niche for me, you know, to stay out of the abstract boxed so this is one step past, but still sort of in that realm. And so I get to play with stainless. It's not just an abstract box form, but uh, it's relatively easy after you get the armature and you just basically start like a quilt, knit one, purl two, just start adding the plates. Well, this piece was built for a themed, uh, transportation themed event. And so uh, Icarus obviously is a failure in transportation and, and the hubris, you know, obviously, you know, don't get out past yourself. <laughs> but uh, I usually try to put some deeper thought past just an interesting thing. But my, this plated form has been something I picked up about two years ago and I'm trying to, to establish a style. Um, I have a theory that nobody stops to read the plaque, but everybody will under, will will recognize a style and so now if you see my stuff around Portland 60 miles an hour you only have to pull over you go oh, that bended that so it's more of a style recognition than a name recognition ploy. Uh, my name's Dale Rieger I'm glass artist. Scott Alexander Steel. Well this is called rusted iridescence and it consists of eight panels of glass. Uh, the glass is kiln formed it's cast I make this on in molds it's about three-eighths of an inch thick. The glass is iridescent. It also has some parts that are dichroic, which is parts like this. They kind of shine all the time. Uh, some parts are, are not dichro or iridescent. Those are obscure type glass. And these can be lit. So at night, if we had the opportunity to have electricity, this could be lit at night. Well, glass has a lot of challenges in that it's luminous and it's reflective and it's iridescent and certain parts of the glass are dichroic. So it's got all those different, different elements to it. And so it can, it can be really shiny, it can be less shiny and you can illuminate it from the interior. Steel gets really hot and it burns. Scott did this great uh, rusted part on the steel. This was done uh, in a certain process that he has mastered. And so then we had the iridescence of the glass and we had the rust from the steel. So that's how we came up with the name rusted iridescence. We started out with these four pieces of glass at the top and Scott had made part of, part of this, the frame and the interior, but I couldn't figure out how to end it with the, with the very top of this. So I took it down to Scott, the interior framework of this with the four pieces of glass on it. And I said, so what can you do with this? And so he made this very elaborate great top, including the uh, aluminum grating at the top. And from that, we decided, I said, well, we can enter this in Auburn. The, the contest ends in about a month, so we can make something that would be bigger than this, because this, this alone is not big enough. So that, after that, we made the whole next section. I made four pieces of glass. We kind of drew up what we wanted to look like. We made the four pieces of glass, put them inside the, the steel framework, and then we went at it. I'm inspired by trying to make monumental pieces. Uh, the advantage of making pieces like this, or even smaller pieces that you can pick up and physically move, they have a real presence to them. And that, to me, is really a large part of what art is. If you can kind of get your hands around it and really 
it can captivate you and you can captivate it. Well, I'm Mark Stevenson, Mark Twain Stevenson, actually. That's on the birth certificate, so I use the Twain sometimes. Well, this is bronze. It's a lost wax casting into bronze, but I also work in stainless steel and other materials. This is the old rooster. It was sculpted in plaster and then cast by the lost wax process into bronze. And the bronze casting comes in several pieces, so then it's welded together. There's probably one piece, another piece, the legs, the head, and then the artist, that's myself, welds it all together, and then we work on hiding the welds. I did think about a painting by a, a French painter named Georges Rouault called The Old King, and there was a print of that uh, painting in my childhood home for many years. That was my father's choice. Maybe he was the old king. So I thought about that when I was making the old rooster, although this is more whimsical. And uh, I hope the rooster is smiling, even though he seems to be a veteran of a lot of rooster fights, but uh, he's still smiling. Well, this one I had a little model that I made out of wire in the first uh, case, and I liked that a lot. So I wanted to make it bigger. This one was a lot of fun to make. It was sculpted in a soft plaster over an armature. And one of the main tools was a cheese grater. You can kind of see the, the lines from that. So this one was a lot of fun. Some sculptures are more difficult, but uh, I mean, I like the results of what I do in whatever medium, but this one was a lot of fun to make. The thing about art in uh in the public sphere is that it's art that you can look at and touch. You can walk up to a, a good piece of art, you should be able to walk completely around it and see something new and different on each side. Um, you can't always do that in a museum. Uh, you can't touch things, that's for sure. I'm a real big believer in taking art to the public. There's a lot of people in their whole lives they'll never set foot into a, a museum or an art gallery, but when they encounter it in their everyday life, it uh, hopefully makes their day a little brighter. That's always a challenge because there's a lot of things that people like and there's a lot of things that people dislike. But I like that part, you know, that creates this huge discussion. And, you know, if somebody doesn't like something, I think you're actually making somebody think more. My view on public art is that, you know, we spend our entire lives, you know, you start with your body, you do um, earrings and you do jewelry and stuff. Well, then you do your dwelling. Well, to me, public art is the jewelry of the community. And so it, it reflects what the community feels and, and kind of what they have to say. We need art, we need individuality. Uh, with that, we come, become uh, enlightened uh, as a community and as a group, as a whole. And to, uh, to stretch out of the box or the circle is, is what we need, is what an artist is intending to do. Is there, it, is, that's what their job is to do as, as, uh, for the public. You know, I, I, think, I think that having art available to the public uh, is, is really important because people more and more just are stuck in their own little bubble and staring at their phones. And if you can, if you can give people even just a, a second of pause, I think that's really important. We think art in the public sphere is very important. I, I have installed several pieces in Washington, Oregon, and California, and the communities that support the arts are the communities that really have something going beyond just what normal communities have. They have people that are really interested in furthering the arts. They have a presence in terms of supporting the downtown core, and if the business people support that downtown core, as well as through the arts, it, it enhances the whole community. What you, Auburn has done is amazing, mm -hmm. you know, because people go, did you see that piece down in Auburn? And I go, no, I've got to get down there. Oh, you need to get down there. It's, it's nice that you guys have taken this on and, and allowed us to show what we can do and give the public a chance to see something different. We need to have art out in the public sphere instead of hidden away in museums. So it's for everybody to enjoy. Outdoor art is awesome. Yeah. <laughs>